Welcome, Ramel Ross, uh, to ADM. It's uh, really good to have you here, um, at least virtually. And uh, thank you for your really outstanding uh, poetic uh, film, Hail County, this morning, uh, this evening. You have created really a kind of new language for documentary filmmaking, depicting the Black experience in Alabama, Black South. And uh, yeah, I have to say you also have made a really successful film. I mean, your film was nominated for Oscar, uh, nominated for the best documentary feature in 2018. And you were the winner of the US Documentary Special Jury Award for Creative Vision at the Sundance in 2018. Uh, and you have won another, other countless awards, which I don't uh, wanna um, tell all about it, but uh, you also have a uh, lots of interviews on YouTube uh, one with Trevor Noah on The Daily Show. Uh, I enjoy watching some of them. And yeah, I mean, I introduce you first from what I know, you are a filmmaker, photographer, and writer. Uh, your photographs have been exhibited around the world and in the US. And uh, your writings have been appeared in the New York Times, Film Quarterly, and Walker Art Center. Uh, you have been selected as one of the new faces of independent film in the Filmmakers Magazine and as a new frontier artist in residence in the MIT Media Lab. And currently you are assistant professor at the Brown University in visual arts department. So your background is more like from visual arts. And you also have completed a short film, Easter's Map, which also premiered at Sundance. Uh, yeah, welcome. And uh, maybe you can tell us first yeah. about yourself being a photographer with this photography background, making a documentary film from still photography to moving images, how did that uh, go along? Sure, uh, thanks Ella for the for the kind introduction. And yeah, it is a, a real pleasure to share the film with uh, this part of the world. But yeah, it's a strange transition, you know, to go from still photography to film. It seems intuitive, you know, one would think that it's, oh, it's, you know, images, it's captured, it's in the camera, but there's the languages aren't the same, you know, time is treated very differently, as you know, in photography, and even even if you're doing diptychs and, and film and so there was a, a big, a big jump that kind of need to be made, which is like, how do you make something photographic, but also participate in the experience of time and extended sort of consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's kind of where I entered into making the film in Hell County is, is how do you distill uh, these moments in the South, which are, you know, their own sort of time. I, I know there's many regions in the world that have really interesting cultures and they have very specific relationships to movement and space and uh, the way that people arrive on time or don't arrive on time or walk on the street. And so translating that to cinema um, as a photographer was was quite a challenge, but quite fun. I mean, a lot of these cameras nowadays, you know, the DSL camera, I don't know which camera you use, they have this double function when you can take pictures and at the same time you can just also take um, moving images. That was also how I got to become a, a documentary filmmaker starting with photography. I was just wondering once more, how did you get started the project? Did you start first to take pictures? And then at, at one moment you thought, uh, maybe it's better to to turn on the video function or let's try out something uh, how did that work yeah i did use a dslr to shoot the film and uh, it's it's really funny right because people when when they first came out folks weren't quite sure that they were shooting um films so they thought they were posing for cameras and so you know you 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 would present it to someone and they would just freeze and you're like no 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 it's a, it's a moving image camera yeah. um yeah, yeah. So but, they're not so aware that there's a whole team of uh, behind the camera, so they feel more relaxed. Uh, yeah. Think. Well, for this film, it was just me shooting the entire time um, with the DSLR, with an on-camera mic. And, you know, I, I moved to Alabama in 2009 and spent a bunch of time um, working in the community and making images. But I was making images with a 4 by 5 camera, mm -hmm. um, uh, a Tachihara, and so using slide film. And those are those old cameras that you have to, like, put the hood over and you're looking through the ground glass and the image comes in backwards and, and upside down. And that's a completely different time-based process of making images. It's really slow. You have to work with the ground glass and get the focus right with the knobs and, and work with these other movements. Mm -hmm. And so I'm making images like that. And I, you know, I, I love working with concepts of uh, the social construct of blackness and, you know, the power dynamics that are inherent in the camera. 
And I realized, you know, almost immediately while making images that I eventually became, you know, excited about that there was this something missing in terms of being able to hold someone's attention, right? Mm -hmm. Folks quite often look at images um, and videos as well online, but they look at images and they engage with them for a moment and then they sort of leave. And that extended engagement was something that I was interested in. Mm -hmm. And so I wondered, how do you extend these moments that are poetic and that are ambiguous and that are very um, complicated and banal um, how do you extend those? And the only thing I could think of was was using a video camera. And so I just kind of spontaneously was like, I'm going to make a film. And, and I asked two of my friends there, Daniel and Quincy. Yeah, yeah. I want to come back to the poetic mode you have in your film, but I want to first uh, talk about a bit about Hale County, because especially coming from Singapore, from this part of the world, we are maybe not so familiar uh, with, with what's going on there. How did you, you said 2009, you went there to do what? Uh, what was your entry point and what yeah. is what is Hale County like I mean maybe you can I mean of course we know it now from your film yeah but um, how would you describe it yeah so Hale County Alabama is in the black belt of Alabama which is this really huge swath of land that spans you know Texas all the way to Florida and it's where it kind of has the richest soil and it was just riddled with plantations when you know um, chattel slavery was was the norm. And so there was a you know huge accumulation of people of color of black folks who were slaves who were working on these farms and these plantations. And when um, the Civil War happened and when you know slaves were freed, um, these places just became sort of hot spots or or um, central locations for black folks because that's where they had already lived and that's where they had um, been enslaved. And even to this day, it's predominantly people of color. Um, and Hell County is kind of in the center of this Black Belt region in Alabama. And I moved there actually to work in the community. I had really no intention of making a film. Um, I was a photographer and I did plan to uh, make images and, and hopefully um, show them places. But yeah, I went to work in the community and that's, that's where I met Daniel and that's where I met Quincy. What was your work in the community? Was it, take, um, was it like photograph? Work, photographing workshops or what did you work uh, what was your work like in the community yeah the i went down there originally for two weeks to to teach a photography workshop in this program called um department of labor uh, uh funded program called youth build which is helping teens from 16 to 24 get their gd and get some workforce development and um i did a quick art program and coincidentally a job opened up and i was living in washington dc and it was really expensive and I kind of just wanted to to be have a, a less, you know, money, uh, pursue money driven life. And so I moved there and mm -hmm. um, I ended up working as a sort of career developer. So I, you know, talk with one on one with with students in the community who are dropped out, ask them what they want to do and try to figure out the best way to to, to help them, you know, whether or not it's getting them a job at um, a fish plant temporarily to make money, whether or not it's concentrating on specific subjects they were having problems with so that we could get them a diploma so that they could go to college if they wanted or they could have another job and another career. Um, but it's, it's it, I think it's, it was amazing because it, it brought me into the community in a way that was just beyond authentic. And I knew everyone because I was going to the high schools and talking to students who were going to drop out. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I also coached basketball on the basketball team at the local high school, and that introduced me to Daniel, and that kind of just gave me, um, introduced me to sports in the community, which is small, and everyone loves sports, and so I just became well known as a coach on the basketball team. So yeah, I also realized that you're also a, uh, actually a professional basketball player, right? You 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 trained for NBA, or is it something like that? Well, you know, I I'm wouldn't say that. <laughs> I mean, I played professional basketball overseas for one year in Ireland and I played in college, but I mean, I, I think I, I, when I was young, I had, a, I think I had an opportunity to go to the NBA at some point, but I had so many injuries in college that that dream, that dream faded really fast, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, basketball is quite also a focus in your, in your film, right? It seems also yeah. like sports is kind of the escape or maybe it can be also a escape um, to, I don't know, to get through university or um, to have a career, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's for a lot of folks in, in Hell County and just a lot of 
uh, people of color in general, whether it's rural or urban, you know, sports and music are the avenues to, to be able to take care of your parents and to be able to uplift your community. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, Daniel and Quincy being, you know, sort of, you know, regular guys from, from the region, they definitely, like both of them wanted uh, that type of acclaim and that type of, um, they, they took that path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was uh, I was uh, checking out where is Hill County, and I was come and while I was searching on the net, where is the place and what what's what, what's happened there? I mean, of course, your film came up constantly. I think you make quite a mark now with Hill okay. County. If you Google oh, Hill County, cool. uh, your film comes up. So I think it was a really good choice of title also for your film because you created a kind of new yeah, really a new knowledge that you made a mark on on Hale County. But another famous photographer has been there before you. It was Walker Evans in the 1930s, right? And yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just struck me that uh, I realized that uh, the Pharma Security Administration in the 1930s sent famous photographers to the South to take pictures and shoot mm -hmm. images of the poor people. And obviously it was quite criticized because they shoot the pictures, it depicted the poor people poorer than they were. And uh, I heard that some of the farmers really complained that, uh, about these uh, pictures and they wanted to sue uh, Walker Evans. It's kind of yeah. interesting. I mean, it's just interesting about taking pictures in general, that you create a kind of reality and these images of Walker Evans now also create history as much as your images do. So yeah, um, yeah taking pictures means taking part and it's not just images, but it really means to create a, a new reality. Yeah. Yeah, and you say, how do we not frame someone? That's it's like one sentence in 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 your film, right? Yeah. What what new knowledge you are you creating, or what do you want to get across from your film? Well, there are really so many things that are embedded in the you know the the impetus or or the ideas or or the why, um, and so it's hard to it's it's almost impossible to sort of summarize. The film is is meant to be experiential, you know, in that it gives someone, you know, the feelings and the uh, emotional tenors and the sort of invigoration of, of music or of going on a roller coaster or of witnessing something that's really interesting. And, you know, experience is a, is a different type of knowledge production than, um, you know, verbal communication. And obviously verbal communication can overlap with um, experience, but, you know, I, I think about the line, how do you not frame someone and and what you're mentioning um, so succinctly about, you know, images and films being knowledge production, being something that um, not only produces a reality that produces a dominant reality when most people um, don't live close to other people in other communities, right? Like the world's too big. And so how do we know about a place? Someone produces a representation of it. And that representation is the only thing you have to go on. And so, um, the film was kind of primarily and maybe at its core interested in reproducing the way that I look at the community and the way that I am integrated in the community and the way that I think about Daniel and Quincy and the sort of access they gave me to their lives lets um, a sort of our relationship translate into um, me sort of being part of their family, which gives you a different type of access to the community mm -hmm. and these sort of layers of of, of, of gaze and then layers of access in the context of experience and in the context of black experience, um, I hoped just gave someone proximity to people in a way that's, that's open-ended that they wouldn't have otherwise. Um, I just uh, recently read the book of Edward Glissant, Poetics of Relation. You know, Edward Glissant is a writer, poet and philosophy from the Martinique. And in this book, he writes that he sees imagination as the force that can change mentalities. and uh, mm that poetics is this transformative mode of history. And he yeah. says, we need a new language to transform history and the relation knowledge we have from one another. So I think that your images is, are contributing to that, yeah, that, that it creates a new knowledge about this place. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much. There's this, there's this quote um, by, or a line in the book, uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Um, Which one? By it's Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Mm -hmm. It's a brilliant, uh, you know, what is it? It's not an odyssey, but it's a sort of road, road motorcycle book that talks about the relationship between 
a romantic view of the world and a classic view of the world and, and connects these to larger philosophical movements. But anyway, the, the author has one line in there very similar to the, to the line that you shared, which is that the world um, has no existence whatsoever outside of human imagination. Mm -hmm. It is the product of human imagination. And so mm -hmm. uh, essentially um, to align with there is the only way to uh, change things is to imagine further, you know, and sort of participation in the natural world is when not imagining an alternate future is just a perpetuation of previous modes of, of living and, and modes of being. That's a good point. Um, yeah, this poetic approach you have, I, I wonder where it comes from, you know, because uh, when I teach students in documentary filmmaking, and I say that you can make something poetic, uh, they often ask, yeah, but what is poetic? I mean, <laughs> it sounds very funny, you know, but uh, where, where, does it come, where does it come from, you know, this, this sense of poetry? I don't well, know if an answer for this. <laughs> I mean, I think I can. I think it, a lot of it comes from sports, right? And I know that sounds like a, a, a non-response, but wait, let me explain. In that, you know, specifically in the US, sports culture is so big and, and you, you very much kind of get squeezed into um, uh, a type of person when you're an athlete and you play at a specific level. Like if you're, uh, you know, a basketball player on a D1 basketball team and doing X, Y, and Z, like you're an athlete that has X sort of view on the world. And then that sort of squishing um, someone into a mode of being was something that I sort of felt my entire life. And I found poetry as the opposite, right? It's something that is presenting you with information, but it's so open-ended that it, it doesn't, it, although a lot of poetry is poignant and, and you know, concise, it doesn't quite foreclose uh, meaning. It, in, in fact, it encourages interpretation. And so moving from sports to basketball, I, I couldn't make images of people and I couldn't make a film that did what I felt bad about having been done to me, which is this sort of narrowing of narrative, this sort of forcing of labels. Um, I became just way more interested in ambiguity and mystery and what people were thinking about something as opposed to what I was saying about something. And so that sort of um, inversion, I guess, is I think where my poetic instinct, and it's just more interesting, like, come on, the best lines are poetic, like the best dancers are poetic, you know, I believe at least. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, about basketball, I just have, uh, a memory of, uh, I mean, I used to live in Berlin and uh, one day uh, they opened a huge Nike store there and mm. uh, they they display their shop like an installation and you hear the squeezing from the shoes uh, in, the, in, the, in the basketball hall, you know? That was yeah. the sound they play in the shop. It's this, 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 this. Wow, yeah, and yeah. That, and that's funny because that's also in your film, I was really, wow, that really took me away when I, First, of course, we are in the basketball environment, and then all of a sudden, I hear these basketball sounds laid over a landscape. You yeah. know, I, I really love these shifts in your film from from sound and image that we hear something completely else uh, from from what we have seen. Yeah. So yeah, it brings me to the whole uh, idea of structure and editing and how you made this film. I mean, I, I read that you work on it five years, you know, and I don't know how many hours you shot or how many gigabytes and hard drives you have <laughs> and how to find a structure for that film, you know, after, after you shoot all the footage. Gosh, the, everything happened very intuitively and very almost linearly, right? Like you start the project. Um, I started making the film and I had, you know, an idea of, of of shooting the film in this way. And then you go to the editing room, you make a cut and you're not happy with it. So you make an adjustment and then you sort of start building um, the sensibility of the project, which of course then informs the way that you shoot it, the mm -hmm. way that you, you know, you pursue um, capturing moments or participating in, in the, the cinematic uh, landscape. But in terms of structure and editing, you know, the hardest part of the film was the editing, but it's deceiving because I knew every moment that was going to be in the film already. Um, the film had 1300 hours. Yeah, that's like, which is crazy, right? You know? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it was, it's like, you know, films, yeah, it's an actual nightmare. <laughs> but, but the, but the images, 
tell you which ones are important and which ones will be used. Because with that, with my strategy of, of finding moments that I, I call the epic banal, which are just like very simple, very normal moments in someone's life, but have this grand potential meaning and this really revelatory uh, visuality and feeling, um, mm -hmm. it takes forever to, to find those or to, to witness those. And so if I shot for four days and I had one image I was like really excited about, I'm thrilled, you know, like that's great. And that's going on the timeline and I know I'm gonna use it because I waited so long for it. Mm -hmm. And as you know, um, as a filmmaker, when you put two things on the timeline or you put a whole bunch of things that are discursive on a timeline, they start speaking to each other. Oh, wow, like this looks like this, this one's framed like this, like this color connects to this color. And when you put them together, it means something. And so then the question became, how do you, um, you know, organize the film with this, this, with this, with this meaning, which is of moments, which is of um, color and form and and open-ended representation. And so, um, the the organize two organizing principles were um, movements. So there are five visual movements in the film, um, and Another one was um, a sort of match cutting, right? Like I wanted to bring images together that had really strong conceptual uh, interpretable meaning, but also had a formal meaning as well. So that the eye, because when you're, when you're, you're shooting something that happened in 2013 and you're shooting something that happened in 2017 and you're putting them together, like their connection has to be discernible to some degree or else it feels too random. And so, finding forms and shapes and camera movements that can bridge the gap between those things um, became a mode of, of making meaning and also just getting to the next thing. Yeah, that's really amazing in your film, yeah. But is it something you planned a little bit before you shoot, as while you were shooting, or is it like in the end you say, ah, oh, yeah, this fits together, or how did it work? Happened six months, like six months in, I made an edit, um, well, at maybe three months in, I made an edit I wasn't happy about. And I went to my footage and I found all of these beautiful moments and I put them together intuitively with that because I, I couldn't make sense of the footage without putting something that was similar beside it. And then I thought, well, what if I made an entire film this way? Mm -hmm. I, I thought it would take 10 years. Um, it only took five, but then I can go out and I can pursue this. I can, I can remember what I shot before and I'm out there shooting and I'm like, oh yeah, that frame looks like this one too, you know? Or um, like the best example is, you know, when Daniel's sweat is dripping on the ground. Um, I captured that, you know, 2012. And then three years later, I'm at his grandmother's house and um, his friend's grandmother's house. And I'm looking down with my camera and it starts to rain. And I just think of that moment. I'm like, oh, wow, that's beautiful. And then that goes on the timeline. And so those types of things happen in real, in real life. Wow, it's it, that's really intense. Uh, what it's I also, no, no intense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what I what I also uh, want to talk about is the focus you have. You know, it's like uh, the depth of field you choose. I mean, it's it's very um, selective. You what you present us, what we shall look at. I mean, just through the focus. You know, it's it's like it's three three meters or something is is in focus, and the rest is blurry. So, yeah. how did you think about that? Or did it just come naturally? Uh, or was it a well, part of a concept? It wasn't part of a, you know, explicitly part of uh, a concept, but it, it was just a mode of um, of shooting and, and being able to focus in on something, right? Because when we see as human beings, you know, we the amount of pixels that we see are just like vast, but also we don't see things the way that cameras do. Like cameras are, M you know, uh, monocular devices, like they, they don't bridge two different things like our eyes and, and give us that sort of depth. And mm -hmm. so that small focus gives you depth and it allows me to control what a person's seeing in the same way that when we look around the room, we control what our eye is focusing on and everything else sort of slides off into the background. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just a better way of, of reproducing to me the actual visual field. Yeah, but that also creates this, this poetic moments, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So your film, I mean, when it started, I didn't know quite how it starts. It feels like somehow it starts somewhere and it ends somewhere. I don't know. It was like a flow of images and sounds and, and impressions. But then the more 
I realized it's quite a, a lot of repetitions and circles, which uh, yeah, it's really mind blowing when you first see these girls in the in the basketball like this. Woo, yeah. yeah. Then yeah. later we see it again, and we we don't see them, but we hear them. So mm -hmm. that's when the repetitions start to come in and this uh, always turning in circles. But it's not only on a visual visual level or like a structure level, but also it feels like that the community there, community there, or well, that's maybe the black experience uh, that they're kind of trapped in these circles. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so first I, I realized when this baby was running, this little boy was running up and down and up and down and up and down. I was thinking, uh, when when is gonna stop? Or mm -hmm it's turning in circles and circles or like the grandma asking the daughter what's your name what's your name what's your name what's your name it's like keep on repeating and repeating and we are in this in this we are trapped in it and all of a sudden i realized that actually everyone is kind of trapped in yeah in repetition yeah that's that's like that's very uh, very keen observation it's 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 a universal thing you know I, I feel like in some degree everyone feels trapped and you know the way in which people of color are trapped in the south is very specific to them but it's something that um you know kind of unites all of humanity uh, not to speak you know too broadly and so it, it was about finding those moments that exist in in the real world behavior of people that point to the connection between them you know me and everyone else it's it's quite beautiful to to start to think about things generally in terms of sim symbolism or in terms of metaphor because they're everywhere you know uh, a metaphor it just you just have to be able to recognize it and and so part of the shooting style was you know looking for these these ideas in the context of the material world in the context of things that are actually happen happening um and sort of pointing to those universals you mentioned yeah there's one moment i especially love is when the grandmom says uh what's your name what's your name what's your name and it, and it feels like and i think that's also the the great thing about your film that all of a sudden you look at something else and uh, we see these leaves on the streets you know and we hear we hear them so clearly i mean i, I just thought wow how did you do that i mean did you <laughs> did you drift away and say i have enough of this conversation and i just see the the leaves <laughs> passing by uh, it feels like your whole film is like that, you know, if you, we, we cannot look at it anymore, we just start to look, look at life itself, you know. Yeah, the exactly. Of life. Mm. Well, Ella, it's, you know, the entire film was a gamble, you know, there's, I, I didn't, we didn't expect the film to be as well received as it was to win these awards and to get nominated. You know, I in, in every every time I'm 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 holding the camera and I'm trying to be present and I'm trying to like really look, I'm always gambling on the best possible outcome for the shot. You know, like how how can I be at the right place at the right time? And like you know the moment where Daniel, you know, uh, he I'm shooting from behind him at the basketball game. He jumps up and he starts dancing and he looks behind me. So I'm shooting a, like I shot the majority of the basketball game just with that shot on his shoulders with the hope that something would happen. Like I had no idea, like, it, you know, it's an illogical way of shooting, but what it does is it provides moments that aren't as utilitarian as traditional narrative moments, moments that are so strange and unexpected that they have a sort of power in life of their own. And and so that gamble paid off really well, but a lot of a lot of the footage didn't. I mean, like I've told you, like days of me doing things like that, like kind of experiments in the moment with Daniel with Quincy, and they're just like the worst. <laughs> this is nothing, you know. I think that's the beautiful thing about making a documentary that this it is these random things that just happened, you know, yeah. without, without being planned, that they're just happening. I'm also always waiting for that moment and thinking, when is the next one coming? You know? Yeah. And you're like, is it going to happen? Like, it's not going to happen. I know it's not going to happen. And then it happens and you're like, yeah. Oh, I often think that something didn't work out what I planned. And then I think hmm, probably it's good because there's something else going to happen soon. You know, yeah. I just give up about uh, holding on to things and yeah. just wait for the next incident to happen. Yeah. yeah, but, like, um, yeah, rest of life. Mm, yeah. yeah. But talking once more about the repetition, I feel like that um, the, the guys in your film, they have sport kind of as a 
escape you know they they i mean they have this hope of, of getting somewhere with the sport but i feel the the female uh, you know, the, the women in your film is just really trapped in their in their situation their motherhood and uh, I, I don't i don't see any escape for them i don't know how how did you feel about that yeah you know the the one thing i think the film is lacking is and it's it's not you know, the, it's impossible to make a film that's complete, right? That does everything. So it's not lacking this necessarily, but the one thing that the film um, doesn't do and doesn't try to pursue is a sort of exploration of what it means to be a black woman um, mm -hmm. uh, in the South. It just shows what sort of Boosie and Mary's lives are in relationship to Daniel and Quincy. Um, Cause it's, you know, it's very much about them and the, the sort of black male African-American experience. Um, but I also, I mean, I, I'm both like cynical and optimistic about most things. You know, I, I can I can say and think that um, everyone's trapped and there is no hope. And then I can also, you know, have faith in the individual um, and have faith in in people to transcend their their social structures or their or their frameworks to pull other people up and to pull themselves up. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's particularly tough for women because. Um, you know, opportunities are slim in general, and and women in general have less opportunities than men. Um, men generally control um, it's more things. So, yeah. Yeah, no, no, I'm I'm not saying it's lacking. It just I just realized that um, yeah, giving birth, uh, taking care yeah. of kids, it's just there's there's no other. It seems like there's no other perspective. Yeah. Well, family is like you know so important for. Uh, for everyone and you know in in the south family you know blood in blood out um to some degree and you know if a woman has a child uh with a man you know quite often they may be burdened with the responsibility it's it's a lot less likely that the woman will leave the child than the man leaving the child and so you do see a lot of mothers um that are single and mothers that don't have um, support and so they also then get trapped into certain types of employment just to sort of get by and then you know the cycle continues yeah, yeah let, let me uh, start a new chapter <laughs> a new question <laughs> but, uh, your film is so successful and i was looking uh, with whom you worked on that film um uh, i mean yeah you had as a creative advisor a, a, a a picture from Vera Settakul. I mean, he's quite famous, of course, also here in Southeast Asia. And um, yeah, uh, Jocelyn Barnes is your producer, or Danny Glover is part of that team. And they also produced um, the films of A Picture Pong, um, yeah, Andre Kumi, who recalls his past lives, and Sam yeah. Sander. They are also uh, like win up Khan uh, uh, Pandor and things like that. Um, how did you meet uh, your producer? How did you pitch your ideas or did they find you? Yeah, they, it was a combination of both actually. So Jocelyn Barnes, you know, she's largely responsible for the success of the film. Um, I met her at Sundance, I think in 2015. Um, I had got a fellowship to go to the festival and just participate in what they call industry meetings where you have a bunch of artists and filmmakers and they pitch their projects to producers who are just interested in meeting uh, new makers. And, you know, she looked at a roster of people and, and saw Hell County this morning this evening and, and, you know, read its byline and was like, oh, I'll meet with this person. And um, I didn't know who Jocelyn Barnes was. Like I, you know, you mentioned it earlier. I, I have a visual arts background um, only, I mean, as a master's, like I studied photography. I wasn't into, I was into film in general, but I wasn't studying film and I wasn't studying commercial film, you know? And so I didn't know who Jocelyn was, but we hit it off really well in the meeting. And in my head, I was like, this person's amazing. Like, who is this? This woman's like, she understands me. She understands the project. Um, and then I, I, I talked to um, someone who organized the meetings and I was like, yeah, I really connected with Jocelyn Barnes. And they were like, you met Jocelyn Barnes? She liked your film? You have to follow up. I was like, why? And then they were like, look her up. And I like looked her up and I was like, oh my God, Jocelyn Barnes. Um, I was probably would have been, I would have been so nervous if I knew who she was beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we stayed in conversation and kind of after meeting her, like, you know, funding for the film was um, easy, you know, and, and getting opportunities was, was a lot 
easier because she's such a trusted uh, filmmaker that everyone's like, you know, I have no idea what your film was about. I don't know what you're even saying about the black, the relationship between black images and documentary truth. But if Jocelyn Barnes is on board, I know she'll put together a good team. And those were like the exact words of multiple people. Yeah. And, and so that, that really helped in the process. And she co-founded a company with Danny Glover and had worked with the Peach Pong. So it wasn't smooth sailing, but we were definitely sailing. We had yeah. some wind, we had some wind in the sails. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Now I mean, it's great to have a producer team like that. It's just like a yeah. dream. It's a dream for a filmmaker. How was your, how was the creative um, advisor? I mean, Apicha Pong, did you sit with him together on the editing or how did, uh, how did the conversation go? Ella, I wish, I wish Apicha Pong and I were text buddies and I could just be like, hey, <laughs> check out this meme. Ha 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 ha. I wish. But, um, you know, he's super busy and I think about six months before we were, we had to, we knew we wanted to finish, we were going to have a final cup. She said that she thought that he would like the project and we should send it to him and see what he says. And so, you know, I was just like, okay, whatever you say, Jocelyn. And so she sent it, he really liked it. And so then she followed up and asked if he would be a creative advisor. And he was, you know, working on his projects in other countries the entire time. But the relationship we had was when we finished an edit, we would send it to him mm -hmm. and he would, you know, reply with some feedback, some thoughts, um, or talk with Jocelyn on the phone. And then we would, you know, take what he had into consideration and continue moving forward. So I've never met him before, but he did provide some, some like pretty insightful analysis and sort of descriptions of what's happening that shaped the film. Yeah, he has also a really good team of editors on, on his hand. On his yeah, side. yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's great to have them. Yeah, I mean, other, other supporters in that team are Laura Poitras. I mean, I saw her film, she made a, she also won a, an Oscar with her, with her film on Edward Snowden's Citizen Four. Um, yeah. So that might maybe also help to get you to this Oscar nomination. I don't know, sorry to ask these questions because I'm also no, no. so curious about it. It's fine, it's, it's important because, you know, people wonder how, you know? Yeah. And most of the, unfortunately, most of the, a lot of success that people have, it has to do with relationships, you know, like who's on your team and who can, who can support you behind the scenes. And, you know, what is, what is your, what does the brand look like, I guess, of your film and, and your squad. And I met Laura at Sundance as well. Yeah, Sundance was incredibly supportive. I also did a fellowship um, called the Art of, Art of Nonfiction Fellowship. Mm -hmm. And there's some brilliant filmmakers in there. And two of them um, have a good chance of being nominated for Oscars this year. Garrett Bradley with Time and uh, Kirsten Johnson's um, Dick Johnson is Dead, like documentaries are both shortlisted right now. And they both did this fellowship that was about three years long with multiple, um, it, it existed for three years. But I met Laura through an editing fellowship through Sundance and we connected. Um, I've loved her work and she had very interesting things to say about the film. And so she jumped on as a supporter. And then that of course opened other doors. Mm. Um, the, the trajectory of this film is unlike any others. It's not reasonable. It's, it's not even one to really aspire towards because it's just fluke and cultural timing. Mm. You know, um, I personally, you know, I love the film. I think, it's, I think it's great in terms of like what I was able to accomplish and my team was able to accomplish. But a lot has to do with the cultural timing, right? if we would have made this film 10 years ago, it would be buried, you know, like there's a huge push in the US right now um, mm -hmm. for, you know, equality and equity for people of color and, you know, diversification and substantial changes and um, adding perspectives to what is generally a sort of uh, a, a Eurocentric view of how to make things and how to live and, and values. And so this film fell perfectly into a, a moment of time. Um, and it's also why it was produced, right? Like I'm a product of American culture that has all these issues. And so I'm thinking about these things when I'm making the film. So yeah, just very fortunate to have the team and the timing. Yeah, I mean, but it's, it's, it's prime time to get, to get support for, for films like that, you know? And I think yeah. it's just really necessary to have, uh, to have this, this new language and this, this new film. I mean, it's not, just, uh, it's not just the support you have, but I think you also really created something outstanding and beautiful and yeah it's, it's a wonderful film 
Mm, thanks, Ella. Thanks, Ella. Yes. It was uh, mm. It's a fun uh, film to watch. <laughs> yeah, it's great. It's, uh, it has also sometimes these moments where you watch almost like a, a music video or something, especially mm. time lapse. And yeah, it's just, it's just, just really nice to watch. Yeah. Yes, um, I try to pull out a last sentence. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, you want to go? With so many good questions, so many questions. That was impressive. I was like, wait, another another good one. What? <laughs> Ella, what, what kind of films? So you make documentary films. What are what have your films been it's focusing kind of on? Funny because uh, yeah, I also made a made a film in Africa. Actually, my filmmaking kind of starts in Africa. I was invited um, at the from the film festival Rotterdam to go to. They had a, a, a special program, it was called Forget Africa, and they invited filmmakers, um, different kind of filmmakers from Southeast Asia, from America, different parts of the world to embark on a journey to the Sub-Sahara mm -hmm. and to choose any country there. And I have never been to the Sub-Sahara, I have no idea. So I choose Mozambique to go to Mozambique. Oh, and, went to Mozambique, cool. Yeah, uh, and it just was really more because I realized that Jean-Luc Godard was in Mozambique to set up a television system in the 1970s. So I just started with that idea that, um, which I kind of liked that Godard embarked, it was called um, the birth of an image of a nation. Oh, wow. Yeah, and it is, uh, of course, it's in reference to that film, but also he, uh, what he did is like, he wanted to make workshops to teach people there how to make films by themselves and so create their own image. So it was like starting, starting a nation, the image of a nation for the people to make their own images. Yeah, wow, I had no idea that he was, like Godard was even interested in the, you know, the social consequences of film in that way. Like, I didn't think that, uh, yeah, that was even his wheelhouse. I thought he was like, because he's just such a conceptual filmmaker and obviously his films don't don't die with concepts, but that's really interesting to hear. I'm going to look that up. But uh, of course, I also realized how difficult it is to just step into another country where you don't speak the language and you're, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm white, yeah, I'm a white woman and yeah, to take out your camera and uh, point it towards other people, other cultures, it, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it brings a lot of thoughts with it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why I'm really glad that you made your film. I think that um, I think I feel like we don't need any more somebody speaking for someone else, you know, or yeah. also even not speaking nearby because we just had a 20 minute hour show here and we were talking about this concept of, of, of speaking nearby. But um, we rather need this kind of speaking for yourself, you know, you don't need anyone else to yeah to make a documentary on the black community it has to come out of the from, your, yeah. from within you know and from the black yeah. community within to create these images so yeah i'm really and there's no more excuses anymore too there's like a, there's there's public there are filmmakers who are capable of doing it you know there's always been excuses as to oh who will do this but us you know yeah yeah there's, exactly yeah. Uh, i mean i have here another quote from <laughs> From Clisson. <laughs> Clisson says that the structure of poetics of relation is based more on associative principles. It's an mm -hmm. enactment of its own poetics, providing a sense of the new relations created in, in its language as a whole. It's transforming uh, ecology. So, yeah, I believe that you created a new language to speak of the Black experience and uh, that poetry gives shape to this new knowledge and can transform history in the way we look at the black community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I I would never claim that I created a new language, but I will say that there are new languages to be created every day. And, you know, most languages are like languages have a specific purpose and it's to communicate something. And in most cases, it's to it's 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 embedded in a sort of power and poetry is in some ways sort of free from that and you know anyone can do it it's just about bringing things together that um that don't have a sort of utilitarian use you know and then you're, you're working in these themes that that we find beautiful i think mm. yeah okay thank you romel for having no thank you for having you here at adm actually we're still at adm <laughs> we just drifted off and forgot about our audience i think <laughs> No, it was a pleasure, pleasure talking to you. Thanks for, um, yeah, for the thoughtful questions and for engaging with the film. Mm -hmm.
Hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah.